left Hitler off with his grand epiphany, where he was singing the jailhouse blues. His original attempt to beer hall push to overthrow the German government ends with him doing about a year in prison. But at least he wasn't executed, which we went over in the last video. So, what does this mean exactly that Hitler had an epiphany? Not real complicated. An epiphany means a life-altering realization. Hitler realizes that the very democracy that stabbed the German soldier in the back from his point of view is what can also put him in power. You don't overthrow a democracy with the barrel of a gun. You overthrow a democracy with the vote. And so he comes out of prison, totally reorganizes the, the Nazi party, makes it a purely political machine, bumps off the guys that originally founded the party so he can always proclaim himself as the very first ultimate Nazi and begins a political campaign to take over Germany. Germany is a parliamentary system. That means rather than having a Congress, they have a parliament. It's still a two-house system like we have. There's the Bundesrat and the Reichstag. Bundesrat is like the German Senate. Reichstag is like the German House of Representatives. Um, the difference is parliamentary systems do not elect a president. Um, whichever party gains a majority of the lower house, the Reichstag in this case, the House of Commons if it was England, um, the German Reichstag, the lower house, whichever party gains a majority of the lower house, the Reichstag, gets to name the Prime Minister of Germany. And so Hitler goes back on the speaking tour, he sends out his henchmen to go on the speaking tour until they can get 51% of the Reichstag controlled by Nazis. Now, technically, they never quite got there. They got about 44%, but the way a parliamentary system works is you combine with other parties until you have a majority. And so, eventually, the Nazis had enough allies that they gained 51% of the Reichstag, the German lower house, and of course, they're going to then name the prime minister as Hitler. They never vote for a president, whoever controls the majority, gets to name the Prime Minister, and the Nazis naturally are going to go for their, what they consider their Messiah, Adolf Hitler. And then, something strange happens. After finally gaining um, power in Germany, it's, it's 1933 by this point, same year FDR has come into power in America, Hitler has finally come to power in Germany. After years of pushing his anti-Jewish propaganda, after years of pushing his anti-communist propaganda, after years of fighting, literally fighting to gain this political power, as soon as the Nazis gain the political power, the actual building of the Reichstag is set on fire and somebody burns it down. Clearly, the enemies of the Nazis are at work. Clearly, this is an act of terrorism. Clearly, this is a national emergency. And so, the Reichstag, um, controlled by a majority of Nazis, declare this a national emergency and completely use their constitutional powers to make Hitler a temporary dictator to deal with the national emergency. And that is how Hitler gains dictatorial powers, and it doesn't take many Scooby-Doo skills to figure out who actually burned the Reichstag. It was the Nazis themselves in secret. A homeless, mentally ill person was hired by Goering, one of Hitler's henchmen, to actually burn down the Reichstag. Um, but it gives Hitler the opportunity to blame it on his enemies, the communists, the Jews, everybody he has blamed for the downfall of Germany. And it, it greatly elevates his power, and he goes on with this program to what he considers makes Germany great again. Um, here's his core henchman. Goebbels absolutely loved Hitler. He was one of Hitler's longest followers. He is put in charge of propaganda. Um, picture a world where the government controls the schools and all the media, all the newspapers, all the radio stations. Everything you're going to hear is pure Hitler, 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 Nazi, 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 Nazi. And Goebbels loved Hitler so much that later, jumping far ahead, after Hitler commits suicide, Goebbels and his wife just don't know what to do. They've, they've got all these children, and now the world has no Hitler. So they go through their little nighttime routine, you know, where the little children brush their teeth, and Goebbels' mom and dad 
read stories till they go to sleep, and then they injected all their children with poison and killed themselves because they could not even imagine living in a world that Adolf Hitler. This is Himmler, who is the core SS thug, who it's the SS that takes over the concentration camps and starts the actual Holocaust. These were the true believers in Hitler. These guys are so bad that literally about two weeks ago, there was a CNN headline about a, a, an old man, 95 years old, was found living in Tennessee, who at the very end of World War II had been um, a concentration camp guard, which meant he was an SS guy, he was a concentration camp guard, and, and he is being booted from America back to Germany um, right now in 2020, even though he's 95 years old because of his affiliation with the SS, and he'll stand trial and probably die before he goes to prison, but he will be punished for World War II crime still in 2020. And this is Hitler's third main thug here, Hermann Goering, who is a World War I pilot and in charge of the German Luftwaffe. He came out of World War I totally, utterly believing that the next great war will be won by airplanes. He was completely right. He just thought Germany would produce the most and the best airplanes. Turned out, um, once you wake up the American sleeping giant, our industrial capacity could produce 50 airplanes for every one German airplane. A similar guy, now on this list, more of a, a general than a thug, was Erwin Rommel, who comes out of World War I believing tanks will win World War II. Of course he was totally right. He thought the Germans would produce the most tanks and the bestest tanks, but um, turns out America produced the most tanks, if not the best tanks, at least the most tanks. We could outnumber the Germans 50 to 1 also in tanks. So this crew takes over Germany, and, and they, they take off with Hitler's program to make Germany great again. We're going to save Holocaust stuff till after the actual fighting. So, so Hitler becomes aggressive. Now remember, oh, I spent so much time on, on Japan and Italy just for this very moment. Hitler has learned, and I'm, I'm pretty sure from discussion forum posts that all of you are getting this, Hitler has learned. As long as you pick on a people that nobody cares about, the world's not going to do a thing about it. He's learned that the League of Nations is totally inept and incompetent and weak. They, they're on a campaign in the League of Nations to outlaw war forever. And the only possible way to stop a war is to fight a war. The League of Nations is not going to do that. England and France are on a campaign for world peace. They thought the surest route to world peace was to get rid of weapons after World War I. Um, the, the insanity there and, and the irony there is the, the best way to avoid a war, apparently, is to have more weapons than everybody else. And, and only one guy was thinking that in England between the World Wars. That was Winston Churchill, but he did not hold power between World War I and World War II. America has gone isolationist. We have nothing to do with world events. Um, our plan is to never get involved in another war like World War I, and we totally isolate and let our military technology fall tragically behind. That's why we had some of the worst airplanes in the beginning of World War II and the worst tanks. And that's why Pearl Harbor was just blatantly left open to attack. We did not believe it was physically possible for Pearl Harbor to be attacked because it was so far away, and we were so far behind on military technology. We just, we, we didn't realize how far ahead Japan had gotten compared to us. So, Hitler starts, um, he starts slow. He, he is smart. He, he always seemed to be one move ahead of the British and the French. He, he did realize that Japan was getting away with it and Italy was getting away with it, but, but Germany is, is different. England and France have always been scared of Germany. England and France spent a thousand years through the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance, right up to the 1800s, trying to keep Germany disunified. As long as Germany was hundreds of small kingdoms, they were weak. England and France saw the German potential and intensely maneuvered politics and diplomacy to keep them separated. And so Hitler realizes, eh, I, I gotta take it easy, I gotta test the water some to, to see just how far I can push England and France. So he starts very simple. Um, very simple things that very easily justified, like one of my what, what, what I think is one of his neatest ideas was he to get the German economy going. It's the Great Depression. He, he's just like FDR and everybody else. He's trying to get Germany out of the Great Depression. He, he makes a program at every airport where anybody can sign up to learn how to fly airplanes. Anybody. And, and then you get a job at the airport, flying airplanes. And then you have a job 
in the Great Depression. Of course, his secret motive is later he'll start building up his Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, and he'll have a, a huge pool of trained pilots to fill those airplanes. But who could complain at first that he was creating jobs and giving people job skills? Um, then he secretly starts building up his air forces and his land forces, totally trampling on the Treaty of Versailles. It kept it fairly secret, so England and France didn't do much about it, but eventually he gets big enough where he decides to reoccupy the Rhineland. I have been having you label that Rhine River on several maps now in World War I and World War II, and this is the shining moment why the Rhine River, you'll have to look at your maps because I don't have one right here, cuts through Germany and creates a piece of land between Germany and France. It's, it's the land where Germany touches France. The Treaty of Versailles ordered it to be demilitarized after World War I. Um, that way the German army couldn't be right there on France's borders ready for invasion. Hitler decides, this is German territory and, and, and I have the right to occupy this land. I can do whatever I want with this land. It's German territory. Um, the, the whole idea is rather ridiculous, actually. Can you imagine Canada telling America, we're a little nervous, so we're not going to have any American military bases in Montana? We're a sovereign nation. Canada has no right to tell us that. So Hitler sends his soldiers into the Rhineland just to see. They're given very strict orders. If the, the French shoot at you, run away. If the French throw rocks at you, run away. If the French look at you in the condescending French way and, and utter French words, run away. The French didn't do anything. They allow Hitler to occupy the Rhineland. I, I, I know your next question is, well, why did they let him get away with it? Well, England and France knew that the Treaty of Versailles was too harsh. England and France, 20 years later, they realize, oh my gosh, that treaty is just fomenting the next war. So now we have to do whatever it takes to avoid the next war. The, the word for that is actually appeasement. And so they, they think, well, we'll just let Hitler do that. It's a pretty minor thing. We'll just let him get away with that. No big deal. Of course, it teaches Hitler um, that he can just do more. Um, I always use a metaphor. This is, this is like a classroom. You guys have seen this throughout your, your whole lives. A, a student will do something very, very minor, not worth the teacher getting upset, and the teacher wants to go on to the class, so you know, they just sort of ignore it, which um, just encourages the student to do something again, maybe minor, maybe a little bigger that time, and the teacher just ignores it, wants class to go on, and so forth and so on. The more you appease somebody, the more bold you make them. And then by the time, you know, the teacher's aggravated to write somebody up, it's just like, what? I've never been in trouble before, even though they know they've been not so good the whole time. Um, but they're, they're not going to really... They're, they're, Students don't take hints easily, is, is what that boils down to. Appeasing people is trying to hint them into being good, and it's really just teaching them to be more aggressive. And so Hitler gets away at the Rhineland. His next stop is the Anschluss. Um, when Germany unified in 1870, um, there have been hundreds of German kingdoms throughout history. Prussia took the lead in northern Germany, and Austria took the lead in southern Germany, and they represented different pieces of German population. The north was mostly Lutheran Protestant, the south was mostly Catholic, so you could surmise that most of your St. Genevieve ancestors actually came from southern Germany, more influenced by the Austrians. Hitler wants to finalize the process. When Germany unified in 1870, Bismarck had pitted northern Germany against the southern Germany, led by the Austrians, and he won a war against the Austrians. And then he fought the famous Franco-Prussian War that we've talked about so much, where he defeated the French in, in six weeks, and Bismarck unifies Germany except for Austria. He squeezes Austria out because Germany is a, or Austria is a big German kingdom that would compete with Prussia. And so the unification is left slightly undone. Hitler's goal, especially since he's from Austria originally, is to finish the job, Anschluss. Uh, unite Germany with Austria. Totally forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. Gets away with it. What's France and England do? Nothing. What's America do? Nothing. Um, League of Nations does nothing. Bit by bit, Hitler just takes each step. We give him an inch and he would just take a mile. And the goal of France and England is appeasement. But they are getting nervous. Um, one piece of land 
that I had you very specifically label on your maps as the Sudeten land. In fact, we should probably just go to a map for that. We'll just scroll down here to the map. Not going to be real easy to see, but... The Treaty of Versailles created Czechoslovakia here. And... Czechoslovakia jabs into the belly of Germany, creating a horseshoe shape where Germans are going to end up living inside of Czechoslovakia. Remember, everybody's angry while they're right in the Treaty of Versailles. They want to they wanna stick it to Germany as much as they can. So, the, the rim here, where Czechoslovakia and Germany meet, is mostly filled with Germans inside of Czechoslovakia. Hitler's a nationalist, remember it's the Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party. He, um, nationalism just simply means that each, each nation of people should have a political country of people. Therefore, Germans should live in Germany. And that's a pretty hard argument to make. Um, or to, to fight against is what I mean there. England and France, how can they say no about Germans living in Germany? Um, they're, they're scared to death, but... Can they really stop Germans from living in Germany? Um, but, but they are scared. And so the leaders of England and France at this point, they do what bosses do and they're not sure how to solve a problem. They call for a meeting. And this meeting is the, the Munich Conference. Um, the, the leader of England this time, Neville Chamberlain, he gloriously flies off to Munich, Germany. Now, Neville Chamberlain is, he's, he's very proud of what he's doing. He really believes he's leading the world into peace. He, he's, he really believes he's succeeding where the World War I leaders failed. He's going to go off to Munich and make a deal with Hitler on how to settle this and avoid the next great world war. And so Hitler, Chamberlain, leaders from France, they all meet in Munich, Germany which is Hitler's homeland. They're like literally in his house. And this is where Hitler would, would do his creepy blue eye thing where he'd stare people right in the eye and sort of mesmerize them with his blazing blue eyes and his extraordinarily charming personality. And the, 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 the result of the Munich Conference is basically England and France. Notice they didn't even bother to invite Czechoslovakia. It's, it's England and France and Hitler. And England and France point their finger in Hitler's face and they say, Hitler, you can have the Sudetenland, but that's it. No more. And Hitler just surprisingly was like, okay, that's what I wanted, so deal. And they sign um, the, the Munich Agreement, which gives Czechoslovakian land full of Germans back to Germany. Um, but that's it. They demand that Hitler take no more. Two weeks later, he takes all of Czechoslovakia. <laughs> He's just laughing in their face and making fools of them. And, and that's where England and France finally realize appeasement's not working. Hitler is that kid that's just going to push and push and push. Give him an inch. He's always going to take a mile every single time. And so England and France declare, if you invade Poland, we will absolutely 100% declare war on you. Now imagine how ridiculous that must have sounded to Adolf Hitler. Japan has been abusing China for a, a decade by this point. Italy was down there abusing the Ethiopians. Imagine his laughter at England and France stepping up to defend Poland. Poland has never been um, a respected country in modern history. Poland was huge in the 1500s and 1600s, but by the 1700s, Russia, Germany, and Austria all decided, we want more land. So they divided Poland in thirds and just took it. And so from the 1700s through the 1900s, for 200 years, the land taken from Germany to create Poland, Hitler's convinced this has always been German land and Germans should live in Germany, therefore he wants Poland. Plus, his primary goal in life is to fight the Russians. He never wanted to fight England or France, he never wanted a world war, he wants to conquer 
the Russians. He wants that Ukrainian breadbasket of the world farmland so his perfect master German race can grow up there on their farms and live much like Thomas Jefferson advised everybody should live, where you grow mentally and physically strong on the farm. Um, he has to cross Poland to get there. Um, he really, truly does not believe England and France will stand up for Poland. But, 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 remember Hitler was always one step ahead of the English and the French. He is not Italy, he is not Japan. He realizes the intense fear held by England and France of Germany. And so, if you remember, I, oh, if we were in class, we'd be saying this a thousand times, the biggest strategic problem Germany has is to front war. If he invades Poland on his way to Russia, clearly he's going to fight the Russians. But if England and France actually do declare war behind his back, then he's got that old two-front war situation again, where Germany has to divide their forces in half, where half their forces have to fight England and France, and half their forces have to fight Russia. And so, Hitler really wants to avoid that dilemma. So he does the thing that people would expect him least to do. He calls the Russians. He, he literally communicates with Joseph Stalin, the, the dictator of Russia. Um, and they make a deal. They both know they're going to fight each other. Um, remember the Russians suffered worse from World War I. They lost more people than anybody. Um, Stalin realizes Russia is going to be the target of Germany. Hitler sees it as the mother of all world battles. His perfect, what he called Aryan, blonde haired, blue eyed Germans pitted against these, these tough, hardened Russians who live on that frozen tundra who are literally descendants of the Vikings. Hitler wants that to be the mother championship of all world history battles to determine the fate of the world. He could have even lived with losing that to some degree. He just wanted to test whose people were actually superior, the Germans or the Russians. England and France had nothing to do with this in his mind. But if they happen to declare war, then he's got a two-front war problem. And so he makes a deal with his actual enemy. Stalin and Hitler signed the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. They just make a simple agreement to cut Poland in half. Um, the western half of Poland is what Hitler sort of generally wants because that's where Germans are going to live. The eastern half of Poland is mixed with a lot of Russians. This will make each one of them happy. They each get half of Poland for now. And they agree not to fight each other for ten years. Um, Stalin likes that aspect of the deal because the Russian army is never prepared. Remember, Russia is our, our, our BFS um, friend. Russia is not prepared for war. They did the worst in World War I, and they're particularly unprepared at this time. Stalin, in his rise to power and dictatorship, wanted the army of Russia to be totally loyal to him. And so in the 1930s, he killed almost all of the officers in the Russian army. This allowed him to take people loyal to him and appoint them as officers in the Russian army. The problem is, it's the Russian army is pretty big, he's wiped out almost an entire officer corps, he needs time to appoint and train these officers and get the Russian army ready for a war with Hitler. Ten years should do, so Stalin agrees to this Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact even though he knows someday he's going to fight Hitler. Hitler loves the plan because he's thinking in his mind, well, I'm Hitler. I can, you can always trust a Hitler to be a Hitler. Um, he can always break the agreement if England and France don't declare war. Hitler is a big liar, liar, pants on fire. He can make the deal, invade Poland, and see what happens. If England and France declare war, he can swing around and fight England and France. If England and France don't declare war, he can plow right through Poland and on into Russia, carrying out his original plans. So here we are. Finally, after too much talk, World War II officially begins. Hitler invades Poland on September 1st of 1939. And that is where we leave this one in suspense.